Good morning. Everybody gets. Everybody always gets silent the last like fifteen seconds. You're like waiting for that. You should just count it down. It'd be more fun. So, uh, well, we're so glad to have you here this morning. It's a going to be a hot one, I think. And if you're a little hot this morning, just uh, maybe you're sitting next to your your hot spouse or your uh, whatever. You can spread apart and get a little air. But it's it's a little it's warm. Uh, but we're so glad to have you here and worshiping with us this morning. And uh, I don't really have any big announcements. I'm John Exman, if you don't know. I'm the senior pastor uh, here at Central Trinity. Um, and we got a lot of good music this morning, and we have special guests. And we thank you to her for coming in here and joining us. And I'm going to let Jim introduce her. So I want to introduce to you Molly Beatum. She has sung here before, but Anne is gone today. And I said, uh, Molly, would you mind being Ann today? So stand up, Molly. Molly is a, a sophomore at the Ohio State University. I guess I'm in trouble by saying the for you Ohio State fans. I probably gonna have to pay for that, you know, that happened this week. Ohio State owns the. <laughs> uh, but Molly is a, and plays the violin and sings, and she's a scientist also, uh, just lots of things. Her dad works at the Wilds, and her mom is a librarian. So uh, we have lots of, uh, intelligence and family also. So uh, Molly's going to lead the service today. I'm so happy to Molly the, to be Anne today. Thanks so much, Molly.
Good morning, Central Trinity. The opening hymn is page 157, Jesus Shall Reign. We will sing verses one through four. Please stand as you are able. Please join us with the Apostles' Creed found on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence to he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prayer hymn is page. Oh, sorry. The children are now dismissed to kids' own worship. Okay. The prayer hymn is page 431 Let There Be a Peace on Earth. Let the 
Thank you so much, Molly, for helping out. Your voice is so beautiful. It's like effortless if you can sit and hear that. Uh, I don't know. I could never do something like that. Weird sounds would just come out. <laughs> but you you were awesome. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing you sing your song. Do we have any uh, prayer requests that maybe we need to know about that happened this week? Or updates? Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Uh, any any others? Yes. Okay, Marcy's niece, thank you. Anybody else? All right, we, and we did have uh, three funerals here in the last seven days too, so remember those families as well, the um, Candace Hoover family who lost, uh, she lost her son in a car accident, and then uh, the two wonderful ladies that we had this week, Barb Walker and uh, Molly. Uh, Bobby, sorry, yeah, that's right. I was thinking Molly back here. That's right, Bobby. Uh, hard, hard for those families. Be, be remembrance in them. And uh, also, we lost, uh, you know, some really nice people for our church that we enjoy being with. So, take a few moments, and we'll pray uh, on our own, and then we'll come back and pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we we come before you on uh, this hot but beautiful Sunday morning where we can share in your joys and concerns that we have as a church that we lift up to you. There's also probably many, Father, kept quiet and are uh, silent but still have so many things going on in their lives as well. We give each of those things to you because we know that where two or more of us are gathered, that's where you'll be. And we are thankful for that as you guide us and love us, give us the grace uh, to be a part of faith and to be a part of you. And we just ask, Father, that there is peace on earth and uh, let it be. Let it be the peace on earth because you uh, sent your son who was the Prince of Peace. Give us the uh, courage to share and speak out, sh to share in our faith and share in the love that we have for, for those around us. And we do that this morning, Father, by sharing together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. <clears throat> and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Fixed upon it, mount of thy. 
Thank you again, Molly. That was beautiful. Uh, you did pretty good too, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> we appreciate you being here, though. Um, it's always the special thing of summer. Not that we don't enjoy the choir, but it's nice just to hear all the special talents that we have around in uh, this church, this town, and uh, that was beautiful. <coughs> We're talking this morning about the circle of influence and uh, if you can see up there some of the pictures are smaller that's just some of the things that we are influenced by whether it's our phone our government our television our newspaper computer uh, the coronavirus uh, whatever it is that's influence influencing us uh, in our life and I asked this of the first service so I asked this of you too what are some of your biggest influences. What are the things or the persons that influence you the most? Uh, a lot of you are just going to say, you know, your family or uh, those that in your family that are around you or maybe your job or uh, a teacher or a, um, just a friend. Those might be the things, but if you were if you were trying to add those up, there are many different things uh, that can lead influence in our life. And uh, I had a uh, a teacher uh, when I was in seminary that was one of my favorites, and he's written many books. And his name was Dr. Donald Joy. Uh, he has since passed away, uh, but I remember in one of his classes. He was teaching us about this circle of influence, and the way he called it is, uh, the title of his lecture was, is Who's Holding Your Trampoline? Because uh, he said the trampoline is just a circle, and it's full of ups and downs, ups and downs, and that's basically life, right? Life is all about ups and downs, and sometimes they're really good things, sometimes they're not. And uh, there's things of concern that influence us. There's things uh, of love that influence all those things. And so what he said was, and he was a psychologist, that if you are truly to have a life that is um, influenced in, in a good way, you need a certain amount of people that are good influence in your life to help you. And so he asked that question, who's holding your trampoline? And, you know, he, he gave us a few minutes to think about it and said, you know, write down the people that you would trust with any information that you had in your life that you wanted someone else to know and you knew that they wouldn't tell someone else, uh, that they wouldn't judge you for what the information was or anything like that. And so you got to thinking about it. And, you know, people said some of their... Uh, people that hold their trampoline, you know, maybe it was a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, uncle, cousin, some type of family member, maybe a co-worker, uh, a fellow student, a friend, uh, a teacher, one of those types of things. He, everybody said a few. Then the question was asked next is the one that made it difficult is how many did each of you have? How many had one to three. How many in here, when I said that, started thinking and you had one to three? Okay. 
how many people had four to eight? Okay. So you had some people that influence you, people that help you, people that you can lean on. Uh, if you have more than eight, you're doing a really good job. You know, that's good because you have people that you can trust. Then hopefully the, pro the great thing is, is that someone has you in their circle of influence and they're counting on you. And, uh, but the, the hard part that he went to is, is that those of you that are th uh, three or under don't have enough people to hold up your trampoline. There needs to be more because life is stressful, difficult. Look at the periods of things that we've gone through uh, even now in the last few years. Things that nobody around here would have ever thought would have happened. Uh, you know, putting ourselves and locking ourselves up in our house, trying to uh, avoid passing a virus on to people, wearing masks in public, you know, things that we wouldn't have thought of, right? That put influence on us, and so people leaned on each other and needed more than ever the support that they had. And so if we have less than three, then our trampoline, eventually, the people get tired, the trampoline shifts, and you're going to have a fall. You're going to have something very difficult that's going to bother you, and you won't have enough people to make connections. He said, then the next group, those of you that had four to eight or so, that's pretty good because that gives you some extra people to put around the corners and put in the middle maybe to give more support. Those that had more than eight, then you were able to do that e even better. Then he asked the hardest question of all. How many people felt like they did not even have one person that was a circle of influence to hold up their trampoline and there were a couple in the room that raised their hands they didn't raise them much because they didn't want people to see but the problem was is, is that they had no one then to go to well here a little later on that book was written in the 70s actually dr joy wrote about that uh who's holding your trampoline uh, Stephen Covey, another great writer, then in his book in 1989 wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and he talked about the two different types of people that there are. There are those that are proactive. They're the ones in life who focus on what they can do and who they can influence. And then the reactive people are the ones who focus their energy on things that are out of their control, and they are just reacting to them. Now think about that. A reactive person, they're the person that maintains uh, that life is unfair, uh, life has picked me out, life has chosen me, uh, and they also are the ones too that play the blame game and say, well, mom and dad did this to me, you know, by the way that they uh, raised me or what they said to me. And so you've got proactive and reactive. Now think about that one. Which one are you? Do you react to what happens to you or are you proactive and you try to gain knowledge about your life and what's coming ahead well, I'm sure we're probably a little bit of both and so Covey had a diagram in his book where he put those circles up the proactive and the reactive and in the middle of it were how we actually were and the actual list depended on the individual but the important thing to understand is that there may be little you can do about many of these things since a lot of them are outside your circle of influence. And that means, again, the things that are out of your control. In fact, if you wanted to, you didn't necessarily need to call it circle of influence. You could call it your circle of concern. You know what that is. There are some of us in here that are struggling with a cancer diagnosis and maybe we're in remission or maybe we've gone a little further than most people thought we would or... Maybe we have cancer and we don't even know it yet, but there's something wrong. Then there's those of us in here struggling through some type of family tragedy. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, somebody passed away and there's an empty spot at the table and an empty spot in the life and it's causing issues. 
It might be a job. Someone's job is kind of just sucking the life out of them. They feel like they don't have anything left. It might be children. Your children made decisions and different things, and you're not sure about what's going to happen to them, and you worry. But whatever it is, you are worrying about things that are out of your control. And what happens then is we become out of control. I do it. We all do it. You spiral. We have a word that we call for it. You know what it is? Anxiety. How many of us are anxious people in life? Yep. Be proud if that's you because if you don't own it, then you're not going to know how to fix it. I'm the same way. You get anxious about life, anxious about what's happening. You get anxious about uh, any little thing. Sometimes you get so anxious about the future that you forget what's happening right in front of you. And it becomes difficult. And so we have anxiety. Some of us go through so much anxiety that maybe we have anxiety attacks or moments where we just feel so out of control because we're so anxious and we focused our energy on so many things that we cannot influence that we just feel like failures. We can't seem to make changes. But then we hit one of those moments where something happens and we created that influence moment for someone else. And instantly you feel like that is what you're supposed to do. Why? Because of what we're going to read here in a moment in this scripture from John. And so we need to know how far our circle of influence extends. You need to know where it ends and where it begins because somebody somewhere counts on you. And it might not be just the random people that are always in our life that we know count on us, there might be someone else. Someone else that we don't really know real well. Someone else uh, that we only know little bits about. And for some reason or another, we've said something to them or done something to them that they have then added you in their trampoline. And when we're not there for them, their life seems to spiral. Here's what... The Gospel of John says for us in that. And it's our first scripture here this morning. And it's John 12, and it begins with verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now, these are really important verses because of a few things. One starts us off right off the bat in verse 20 there. Where Jesus was, there were some Greeks among them. And they went up to the festival, and they went and they sought out Jesus' disciples, two of them, Philip and Andrew, and asked if they could see Jesus. In fact, they didn't really ask. They said, we want, we need to see Jesus. Now, why do you think that is? Actually, this part is included here in this story because it's telling us a very important thing. It's saying that the Greeks came and said, we needed to see Jesus. Well, we know who the Greeks are. They were the outsiders because the gospel was written for the Hebrew people and for the Jews, for God's own people. But then it also began to be included for us when Jesus died on the cross for us. And this is one of those instances where the Greeks came and it's included in the story because here they're representing the Gentiles, which in turn then represent 
us. And so in this moment, it's like one of us saying, we need to see Jesus. Now, it doesn't say why they need to. It doesn't say what they were after. It just says, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And you see how it goes. Philip told Andrew. Andrew and Philip then when in turn told Jesus. And what does Jesus say? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Meaning, okay, now is my time to share and show that to those who need me. But then he begins this story about a kernel of wheat falling to the ground and dying and it only remains a single seed and if it dies it produces many seeds. It's one of those teaching moments for the disciples but they probably were sitting there and they were kind of looking like you're looking back right now which is like, what? What does that have to do with anything? Why are we talking about farm stuff here when these people say they want to see you? Heal them. Do something good for them. You know what? They're here for a reason. What is it? And he's saying, if a kernel of wheat falls and dies and all those things, right? Because Jesus knows what it's really all about, and he's trying to teach them a lesson. That when you are holding up someone's trampoline and they come to you, you need to know why it is that they're where they are. And what the Greeks were asking is, is what do we have to do to be a part of who you are? What do we need to say? What do we need to do in our life? And so he says this kernel of wheat story, and he follows it up with, in verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Bible's using lose here, but it's a different terminology. It doesn't mean lose as in, ha ha, you lost. It means lose as in, ha ha, you can't find anymore what it is that's important to you. You've loosed it. You've lost it from your life. It disappeared. That's why Jesus says, those who lay down their lives and lose them and follow me, will gain more than they ever had. Because what we're doing is we're loosing or laying down our old life and we're saying, here, Jesus, I'm here for you. But in that, we're really asking the same question the Greeks did here, which is, where's Jesus? We would like to see Jesus. And ultimately, when we come to church or when we're brought to church or when someone that we know influences us and says, hey, come to church, that's ultimately what they're saying. Come and see Jesus. Come with me. Or if it's you, come with me, help me, come see Jesus. Now how would you find Jesus in church? You would find Jesus in church because who's the church? You're the church. We're the church. And so if we're the church and Jesus says that we're responsible for losing our life for him and keeping it for all eternity then we need to be the ones who are the church that actually shows others what the church means. But, and there's a big but there at the end of that, if you are the one who's sitting there and hating your life, you will keep it forever. Uh-oh. That's pretty big. If you hate your life, if you are one of us that sits there and every day wakes up and uh, you're not the person that wakes up and said, ah, oh, good God, thank you, it's morning. You're the person that wakes up and says, oh, good God, it's morning. That's like life. If you are the person that says, thank you, God, for each and every day and each and every moment I have, that's great. But are you the one that says, thanks, God, this is really great. This is what I needed. You know, you can tell those people because at, at Christmas, they're the ones that open the present and they're like, oh, thank you. I needed that. And they set it down and like two years later, they re-gift it to you. And you say, didn't I get you this? And they're like, no, I don't think so. I don't think you did. I know, Willard's laughing because he does that all the time. I'm sure, Sharon, you probably got one of those. But that's what we do. But what really is needed is 
is we need to take that moment and say, okay, God, I don't want to just have this life that I hate for forever. And so we go back to our circle of influence, our trampoline. And when we get to it, we get that last one. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. If we follow the Lord, then we know the Lord says that he will go with us. Why? Because at the end of Matthew, he says, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to leave one here with you who's even better than me. But he will be with you always, even until the end. I'll never leave you. And so when we feel anxious, out of control, scared, whatever, it's because not that the Prince of Peace is giving us peace. It's because the Prince of Chaos is going into our life and stirring the pot and telling us, where's God? He's not helping you. You're lonely. You're afraid. Your life means nothing. I know I hear those things even as your preacher as myself. But what we've got to do is to put aside those words of chaos and hurt and listen to the peace that comes from the one who loves us so much that he died on the cross for our sins when we weren't even around yet. And if we do that and follow the Lord, we'll know that Jesus is there with us and we will serve him for forever. So we got these moments in our life, these moments that appear. The Greeks' request to see Jesus, you see, wasn't just any little old ask. It was on behalf of the rest of us, the whole world. They were saying, we need to see the Savior. Stark contrast, right, to a couple of verses before. <coughs> the Pharisees who are, they're upset. They're exasperated by Jesus and what he brings to the table. All they want is their control back that they used to have. And so they don't want the Greeks, the outsiders, to come to God. They want it to be just the way that it was. And really what it is, is it's a strategy of life, of worshiping Christ together. Together as groups of people, as one, not just a group here, a group there, <coughs> You ever notice and walked around this area for just a moment or drive around it here downtown? How many churches are in this four-mile, three-mile radius? Anybody know? Is it ten, do you think? It's probably quite close to that or a little, maybe it's more, I don't know. But there's one like on every corner, and they're like the same kind of buildings too. They're, they come up from the ground like these uh, leviathans that are there. And they're on these different corners. And there's people that drive by here and they maybe work here and drive past it or they walk past it. And I wonder if they wonder what's going on inside that building. And it's why, folks, we have to go and bring the people in and bring the people to Jesus because they would like to see Jesus, but they don't know what to do. And so you and I have to influence them. We have to use our influence to bring them. Maybe you say to yourself, well, you know, look at my pew. I brought this whole pew. That's pretty good, right? Maybe that's just your family, though. Maybe you could go out and spread out just a little bit from that. Not that we're looking for glory or everlasting wonderful moments, but no, we're looking to serve and to bring people to see Jesus. 
So listen here what Paul then has it say in Romans chapter 12. And this is what he's getting at about the circle. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. It is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Those are such powerful words that Paul is writing, and it paints a picture of what your influence, your circle, your trampoline should look like. It should be sincere. It should hate evil. It should cling to the good in life. We should be devoted to each other in love. We should honor one another above ourselves. We should always have zeal and spiritual fervor. We should always want to serve the Lord. We should always be joyful in hope. We should always be patient when those have affliction. And we should always be faithful in prayer. Think of all those things. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. In the Methodist Church, we call for radical hospitality. You know what that means? That means that you should be so hospitable that the person that's getting all that hospitality should feel almost like, well, this can't be real, right? These people can't love me that much. That's what it's for. And then living in harmony with one another. Being willing to associate with people of low position. Not repaying evil for evil. Do not take revenge, for God says it's mine to avenge, and I will do the repaying. Feeding our enemy, giving them drink, and not being overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How many times in our own influence do we try to hit evil back with evil? Because we can't stand it. We say to the people that hate us or go against us, and we live in a restless world who cannot express themselves without using violence or intimidation or any of those kinds of things. And if as Christians we look at them and just look back at them and say, I don't like you very much. That's not going to do anything. Or I hate you and what you stand for. That's not going to do anything. We know what changes people. It's repaying evil with good. Why? Because God says, I will avenge. I will be the one repaying. It is not on you. But then we say, but we have to, right? Because it's the world that we live in and we need to love. Then do it. Do it. Stop talking about it and do it i'm preaching to myself as much as well when people come through our doors they should come in because we the church influenced and brought them in and when they come in it should be like this wow look at those people they're serving god left and right 
They're servants of truth and love. They're not here to separate or to hurt, but they're here to love and be loved by others. And so I tell you this this day, those that are influencing you, that circle, if it's one of those things up there, it's influencing you to the point that it's not helping you at all. But if it's one of those people in here sitting near you, or it's a hymn that you heard or a song that you heard, like today, if Molly's song spoke to you like it spoke to me, then you know that your heart is moving in the right direction. And so today on this day, as like we share in communion together, that's what communion is about. It's about that moment that we share with God so that we can overcome evil with good, with love. If you want to open with me your hymnal, to page 15, right there in the beginning. We'll share in the great thanksgiving together. Right at the bottom, page 15. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and and praise. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. See, we have these moments and we share and pray them together because that's what God wants us to do is be those good and faithful servants. And so when he took the bread and he broke it, He broke it with purpose for his disciples because he wanted them to hear these things. He wanted to hear the Greeks when they came and they said, we need Jesus. He wanted to hear them because we need to hear them because we're their influence. And so he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. You can go ahead and take your bread. Then he took the cup and drank from it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from it, remember me. Take and drink. You bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in this moment, in this moment of influence. May we be a part of that circle of influence for you in someone's life. May we bring them and lift them up, give them to you. And then when it's our moment, may we give of ourselves to you so that we might be your servant in this world that we live in. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is page 398, Jesus Calls Us. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Please stand as you are able. Jesus. 
Give our hearts to thine obedience, serve and love thee most of all. What a, what a great closing line for us as we go from this place today. Remember that, take that as you influence the world around you. It was good to see you this morning.